Welcome, everyone. It's, it is great to be here. I'm Lester Holt from NBC News. Happy to be back in Aspen and really thrilled about uh, the interviews I'll be doing here, including the first one uh, with Candace Parker, the great Candace Parker. A recent retiree, it sounds weird to call you a retiree, of, of the WNBA. Uh, 16 seasons playing with a league. Let me just rattle off some of the many accomplishments. Um, you're the first player to win three WNBA championships with three different teams, a two-time WNBA MVP, two-time Olympic gold medalist, and it goes on and on. Uh, when you think about all you have accomplished, when you think about all you have accomplished, does it make you sometimes wish you had stayed in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because I think um, during my career, I was so in the moment of, okay, I want to accomplish this and how to do it and the steps that it takes daily that I don't know if I really started enjoying the process until later. Um, I think there was a huge weight off my shoulders in 2016 when we won the WNBA championship. That's when I started like enjoying the process. And so I think if I were to say, I wish I would have taken time during my career really on a daily basis to really see how amazing it is because 16 years, the days are, the days are long, but the years are short and it, it, it flies by, but I'm super grateful for just being able to to play in the WNBA as long as I did. Yeah, did anyone, anyone try to talk you out of it, retirement? Well, my foot uh, oh, wasn't well, allowing that to happen. That, yeah. yeah, there's the foot. So here, here's the thing, um, and I think Isaiah Thomas, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Chicagoland area, uh, was, <laughs> was not a bad boy fan. The Detroit Pistons were like the arch enemy of the Chicago Bulls, and I was taught to not like Isaiah Thomas uh, growing up. I started working with him at NBA TV and he told me something. He retired at 34, I believe. And he said, when guys are crossing you up that, you know, if you were capable in full health of just like dominating, it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. And it got to that point where it was like, I'm going to rehab, come back. And then I have these rookies that are coming in. <laughs> I have these second, third year players. I got to defend, you know, the Aaliyah Boston's, the Brianna Stewart's like, I'm good. I, I'm good. <laughs> I'm cool. I just, you know, I think I could have played another year, but the way I wanted to play another year, it wasn't going to be possible. I think it was interesting when you announced your retirement, really not a lot of fanfare. It was a simple post on uh, Instagram. In part, you said, I promised I'd never cheat the game and that I'd leave it in a better place than I came into it. You feel like you accomplished all that? It's so crazy because as careers go on, I've been kind of in that middle ground, you know, where I'm not an old head. <laughs> That's what we call them. <laughs> the, you know, the before the 2000s playing in the WNBA. I'm not new school. I'm in that like sweet spot in the middle. So I was able to hear the players like Lisa Leslie, um, Delisha Milton Jones, Tina Thompson, Diana Taurasi, Katie Smith. I was able to hear what they said they wanted to do when the time came to retire. And I watched some of them do it, but some of them not. And so I think sometimes the emotion of, the stopping point of a career is so hard, but it's going to come eventually, whether it comes this year, next year, the year after. And I think it's what, what you want to do. And I knew, I said, I always would know in the off season when it's not as easy to get up because everybody wants to play in front of 20,000 people. And when the lights come on, you want to be able to knock down the jump shot. But in order for me to be ready to knock down the jump shot, I have to prepare and to be ready. And it just became so challenging uh, to get my body ready to play. So I don't think I cheated the game. And I can say that um, in the mirror every day. I miss it more than anything. But as you can see, like where women's basketball is now, I think our generation did its part and left it in a much better place than we came in. I, I want to... I want to get to that idea of where the league is right now in a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about you and next, your next act. You were working for Adidas now, women's basketball. What can you tell us about your new role? I am so excited. Um, I always want to continue to grow the game, and I think that there's this, like, challenge as the days, you know, the, the days ahead of you become far less than the days behind you, and... 
you know, you know, the time's coming to the end. I've been with Adidas for 16 years. I'm super grateful that we've been together while I played overseas for 10 years. We've been together when I was pregnant with my daughter, when I delivered my daughter through injuries. I've had eight knee surgeries, um, one foot surgery, one shoulder surgery. So I've had 10 whole injuries, you know, in my career where I've missed time. And Adidas has always stuck with me. Uh, and I can remember the feeling that I felt when I first got those exclusive T-Macs and they sent them to me as a high school girl. And then it became that brand loyalty. So to be able to do something with Adidas and grow the game of basketball and to, to find the next and to build from the grassroots level. And it doesn't, yes, we want to find the next, you know, all-star and superstar, but we want to impact the game. And that starts at the grassroots level. That starts at high school, college, and on a global. And so as Adidas women's pre president of women's basketball, I'm really excited to, to do that. And I think from the perspective of an athlete that's played, from a perspective of one that was recruited for a brand, from the perspective of like, how do we build women's sports and continue to amplify the game as a whole? Because, you know, now it's women's sports. We don't say men's sports. So do we go away from that? Like, do we want to just be considered basketball or do we want to be women's basketball? So I think there's a lot of forks in the road right now. And especially with what's going on now, I'm excited to be. Well, let's talk about what's going that. on now. This okay, explosion, explosion of new talent, obviously, in the league. Uh, T-shirts are selling. Uh, TV revenue is up, uh, audiences in person watching games. Um, is this a temporary, you know, a one-off or is something fundamentally changed with women's sportsmen, in particular with women's basketball? I'm a big, big believer in how do we, how do we keep this from being a moment and use this as momentum? Like how is this momentum and not a moment? And I say that in everybody was so surprised that people watched the first time the NCAA women's championship game was on ABC was two years ago, mm. right? That's kind of crazy. It was buried on Sunday on ESPN against NFL Sunday. It was buried. Some of the greatest rivalries LSU played South Carolina the same time that the chiefs played. The NBA, I, I work for the NBA. They are avoiding at all costs playing on Sunday. We actually switched our television nights for Thursdays because NFL Thursday was messing with our ratings. So I think this time now has a lot to do, yes, with the players rising to the moment, but also like investing and making it make sense, putting it on ABC, changing games to be able to have pregame shows, investing dollar amounts in getting people to the games, um, you know, selling tickets. And it also comes with companies investing in the sport themselves. And, you know, we always like to say like scared money doesn't make money. Everybody knows that from personal investment to whatever. So if you're going to invest in something, you have to full, fully do it. And I think for so much, so many years, people were half investing. And so now we're able to see like, Yes, the players rose to the moment. You look at Caitlin Clark putting up 40. You look at Angel Reese and her double-double. You look at the moments outside of it. And that's the thing. Like, women, we're full of, we're a whole, we're more than just athletes. It's about fashion. It's about personality. It's about brands. It's about social media. And we're seeing that now. And it can't be denied because the social media numbers and the television numbers and the ratings, I mean, all that is proof that, you know, it's here to stay. It just has to be invested in the right way. Are we, and I mean the collective we, <laughs> the, the collective we, are we taking care of these young athletes now who are breaking out in such a huge way? That is an amazing question. And it's so interesting because I have a 15 year old daughter now, and I know there are a lot of social media famous kids at 15, 16 years old. And I look at my daughter and I cannot imagine a grown person coming on and we, we, you know, because of who her mom is, we do receive a little bit of that online and things like that, but just grown ups going at kids at 15, 16 years old and also getting better. I mean, at 15, you, you weren't complete, right? Mentally, physically, emotionally, 
you weren't like, it, it takes time to sometimes grow. And so we automatically write these kids off or we throw them the keys to the entire world at 15. I mean, we look at someone that was kind of the first of its kind in LaMelo Ball. Um, we look at now, it's just, you talk about these college athletes and listen, that's not all bad. I mean, Caleb Williams just opened up a venture capital firm <laughs> his first year with the Chicago Bears, uh, first year in the league. So it's not all bad, but I think it's, we have to continue to figure out ways to help them with their mental health. I think we also have to continue to un allow them to understand that, yes, you're getting NIL money at this time, but how do we help them grow financially? How do we equip them with the right tools for financial literacy to understand that, you know, where their money is going and not just have someone else do it. Um, so I think it's just, it's an interesting time. And I think it's our job now to figure out how we put those parameters in place to protect them sometimes from their own success. Yeah. In that vein, we have seen those seeming to, to highlight this idea of the, the old school, the veterans versus these young upstarts as if there is tension there. Is there tension there? So let me, let me put it this way. There's competition and competition is healthy sure because is. guess what? As a vet or as a senior director at your job, like someone young and hungry coming in. Yeah. You want them to be successful, but you want to be more successful. Mm. Right. And so I think we're forgetting this layer of like competition. There's a competitive element of things. And listen, I'm the youngest of three. I have two older brothers. There was competition on who could get the last pancake at my, my table. Um, and my brothers never let me get it, <laughs> you know? So I think there's an element of competition that's healthy, that raises the bar. Um, but yeah, like in every situation, you're going to have negatives with it. I mean, you're going to have people that want to be better and want to, continue to grow their game. And I think that sometimes we're confusing that with hating or we're confusing that with another layer um, of things. But listen, I was a rookie coming in the WNBA and it was not easy. And it was not easy with the players on my team. I played with Lisa Leslie, who is one of the greatest of all time. And my first practice, they put me on the white team and they didn't call a foul the entire practice for, on, on, for, for me. So <laughs> the whole practice I was looking and I didn't know this was the play going in and you can ask Delisha and Lisa to this day and Michael Cooper was our head coach. It was all by design because they're like, you're not going to get any calls against everybody else. So in practice, you're not going to get any calls and you're playing against two of the best. And so, yeah, I think it's magnified now at this level with the rookies coming in and everybody scrutinizing what they're doing. And by them, I mean, Angel Reese and Kaylin Clark and the Cameron Brinks and things like that. Um, and it's an elevated level, uh, for sure. Let me ask you about, uh, if, if this is more than a moment, what does parody look like with the NBA players? What does parody look like? I guess I'm saying against the NBA players. So to me, I full, I wholeheartedly believe in growing. Like we have a blueprint. We're fortunate to have a blueprint and the NBA took 30 years to really establish itself as a league. Same thing with MLB, NFL. So we're right at the 28 year mark, right? Where we're going to inspire the next generation to even want to play basketball. College is going to aspire to play. But in the WNBA, we have, you know, 12 teams. And the expansion now is going to go to 14 in the next two years. And so to me, I'm a little nervous that it's the star power, because as we know, even looking at the NBA, it's really tough to carry a franchise. Like it's really tough to find your franchise player. And in the WNBA, we have a lot of players that are capable of making rosters. I don't know if you have a lot of players that are capable right now of carrying franchises. So that argues against expansion so it, too it, quickly. To me, I think we expand, but we expand roster. Like we still have 11 or 12 players on the roster. So guess what? If somebody twists their ankle on the road, and somebody else is sick, you only have 10 players in practice and you're playing against practice players, which is great. But when you're on the road, the practice players aren't traveling with you. 
So that the NBA established the G League. And to me, I feel like we need those eight, nine, ten players to get better. And only, the only way to do that is if they're able to make rosters and to have a chance to play. Because honestly, in the WNBA, if you don't make it in the first three or four years, they write you off. So think about it. Think about the players that have come on late in the NBA. You know, you think about the players that are able to develop. You think about, you know, I mean, if you look at Ja Morant, I mean, he came on the scene. But if he didn't have time to, like, develop, you think about Desmond Bain, right? You think about, I mean, shoot, Jalen Brown just won finals MVP. Can you imagine? So I think it's like it's giving players an opportunity to really develop, and the only way to do that is to expand the roster spots. We've seen a number of leagues embrace the idea of really selling their brand overseas, playing mm -hmm. games overseas. Has the WNBA been able to take advantage of that to this point? Well, for 10 years, I played, I played overseas. So I played in, in Russia. I played in China. Um, so I played in Russia for six years, I played in China for two years, and I played in, you know, Turkey for a season, um, plus or minus. And so with that being said, you know, it's interesting because your best players are going abroad to play basketball. And if you look at the NBA right now, you know, Adam Silver just talked about expansion, and he said Las Vegas and Mexico City were two teams in that list of expansion. Mexico City is obviously overseas, not really overseas, but mm -hmm. another country, Canada, NBA invested in NBA Africa, and we've seen the talent pool that's coming out of Africa. And so I think in terms of the women's game, yes, we need to gr grow it or nationally, but we can't forget about the international component. Um, I've been fortunate enough through Adidas to go over and see basketball in Japan and to be a part of clinics and the growth over there. We've done a couple clinics in Germany as well. And so I think we can't forget about the global impact of the game. And um, I think we can do it simultaneously. I, I think just like the men go overseas with their brands and do world tours, I think the women should do that as well. And, um, you know, I hope that's in the works. Uh, I know it is at Adidas in the future. I just want to pause quickly, let folks know we will um, have time, hopefully, for a few audience questions. So begin to think about your questions right now. We'll try to get to as many as you can. Um, Caitlin Clark, jerseys are selling out. You are a three-time champion. I know you told Draymond Green in an interview last year that after you and the team won the WNBA championship, you couldn't even find your own jersey for sale. Thinking back over, over the arc of your career, how different was your start versus the start of someone coming in the league today? So in my Instagram posts, I wished it wouldn't be so hard for the next generation because I think some of the stuff that we went through, it was just difficult. And, you know, I'm all about make it make sense, both C-E-N-T-S and S-E-N-S-E. -E. <laughs> like, <laughs> make it make sense, right? Like, that, that's, how, that's how it should be. Look at the women's soccer team and what they were able to accomplish. You could not find their jerseys. It took weeks to be able to even get the link to buy their jersey. Um, when I got to the Chicago Sky, you couldn't find my jersey. And the people that ordered my jersey, it didn't come until, you know, weeks, months, sometimes later. So they ended up making the, you know, the design your own with, with my name on the back and designing their own jersey. And so, you know, I think it kind of is one of those things where it's like, are we finally getting it right? And I hope we are. I hope we're, we're planning ahead. I hope we're, you know, having the merchandise. I hope we're... I hope brands are seeing that, you know, women's value just because for so long we've been paid less in spaces that maybe it shouldn't be the case, that brands are stepping up now and seeing the value in the eyeballs because numbers don't lie, right? Like numbers don't lie. Check the scoreboard. That's what it is. All the numbers and all the millions of people, they put it up against what? The first round of the NBA finals, the first game. I mean, 18 million people tuned in to watch NCAA games. You look at the numbers with NCAA with Caitlin and Angel Reese going at each other in the game on Sunday, the numbers don't lie. And so the excuse of, well, it's less than, well, it's, 
you know, we, this is all we have. It don't, that doesn't fly anymore. And so I hope that that's, and this generation seems to be demanding that. And it, it's super powerful. We're just a few weeks away from the Olympics in Paris. How is Team USA looking in your view now, standing from the outside? I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't look at Team USA that much. But listen, I know that with our amount of talent that we have and our pool of talent, I've always said this, we, we could win gold, silver, and bronze. So really it's about putting the best team together but it really, you're, even the, if you do make mistakes with Team USA, you're still going to win gold, silver, and, and bronze. I think it just speaks to how dominant women's basketball is in, in the world. Are you surprised that Caitlin Clark was not selected for the team? Am I surprised? I don't think so. Um, I think in terms of what USA's tradition has been and where it's at, you know, in, in decision-making. And again, you're, you've, what is this? They're going for seven straight gold medals, right? Like I think you can have on the team who you want to have on the team. And, and to be honest with you, I think it's going to be interesting. The next phase because you're going to have a lot of newbies that are coming in that have never played, you know, in the Olympics. And so, you know, it's a new era in USA basketball, but I, I don't think I'm surprised by any omissions. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Um, as a kid, I understand your nickname was can do. Is that correct? Correct. As in, so how did you get that? And how does that, how do you play it through your life every day? So funny. My brother's, um, it was shortened. So my brother's nickname, he can do anything and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> And so it shortened to can do. Um, it kind of became like a little mantra of mine. My brothers were my heroes growing up. And kind of being in their shadow a little bit was a little overwhelming. They're 8 and 11 years older than me. Um, my oldest brother played 10 years in the NBA and was drafted in the 97 draft. So watching that as a you know, 11, 12-year-old kid was just so unbelievable to be honest with you and then my middle brother um a lot of people ask him what happened to him uh he has two professional athletes as siblings but he's a doctor so i i have to remind people i'm like <laughs> he's not the black sheep of the family like he's a doctor like you know and so it, it so um it was a little overwhelming my brother was brilliant my other brother was just great at sports and and so growing up my mom would always whenever i would doubt myself she'd be like can do and it kind of stuck. And so... Um, it's got a nice ring. Yeah, it's got a little... It's yeah. got a nice ring to it. So I'm, I'm grateful for, for their example and for them being great role models in everything they do. And so I was fortunate I didn't have to go too far out of my house to, to see what it was like to, to be great at something. Have you given much thought to getting back in the WNBA and a coaching uh, nope. ownership? <laughs> ownership. Oh. Okay, we can o talk about ownership, that. Ownership, yes. Coaching, no? Is it? Ah, coaching. Take your time. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the most patient um, person, and I feel like you have to have a lot of patience to coach. Um, I'm learning that in this, this next phase of life, and especially with my 15-year-old, 2-year-old, and 1-month-old, so I'm learning patience. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I do want to, in some capacity, be back in the game. I miss it so much. I just was able, in the last week or so, to turn on the television and watch it because I miss it so much. Um, but I definitely want to, I want to own a team. And I think the reason why I want to own a team is because I know the cultures that work in winning. I know that it starts at the top and it trickles down and everybody has to be aligned. I mean, we know corporations and organizations that have great culture and empower and teach and bring along. And so I really want to be a part of that. Um, and I don't want to just li limit. I want to do... WNBA, NBA, I'm a huge NFL fan, so hey, NFL ownership. I love NFL. hearing this from you because I'm sitting here thinking, what are young girls thinking listening to you right now, unabashedly saying, yeah, I want to own a team. That's, that's huge. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I always try to have like a person that I look to. Um, and in that case, you know, Magic Johnson you know, taking um, 
athletes to me and, and being a businessman, like a lot of times I think in that era, like athletes weren't thought of as businessmen or businesswomen, and they weren't able to sit at the same tables and enter the same rooms. Their money was, but they weren't. And I feel like it was super powerful what he's been able to do from a business standpoint. You know, I look at, you know, Michael Strahan and what he's been able to do from a commentating, from just taking his NFL career and making it. I mean, he literally says good morning to millions of people. He reads off a teleprompter. <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive. He's not the one answering the questions all the time. He's the one asking as well. And also, you know, I joke a lot, but Jay-Z is another inspiration of mine um, from the standpoint of like rappers weren't known to be able to go into rooms and to, ma to demand equity within stuff. They were the ones that were taking and just being paid. And just the way that he's thought about expanding and developing his brand. And I mean, I love his lyrics as well, but I think Jay-Z is just super impressive. And I think just looking up to men, I, I want to, I want to enter women into the chat. I mean, you look at what Serena has done. So I think that it's coming. Um, and my goal is to continue to open up doors for other young athletes uh, to be able to aspire and be what we want because I'm 38 and I'm retired, right? Like I'm 38 years young and I'm retired. I have my whole life ahead of me. So like, what's next? And I will, I will, I hope to be able to help, um, you know, that process for others because it is scary. Even though I had things laid out for me, television and Adidas women's president, it's scary when the ball stops bouncing. Can you talk a little bit about the hard work it requires to, to play and to be at the level that you have played at and, and the message that you would send to kids who want to be like you? It's so interesting. I look at her every single day, my 15 year old daughter, and um, she's, a, she's a pretty good volleyball player. I can't say she's good yet. She's working. You're tough. Hey, listen, I came from, I came from a tough family. Um, she's working, and I think it's breaking down that process and relinquishing the results is what I would tell every player. I think everybody worries about, like, what's next? I'm working this job to get here and to do this, but you forget about, like, the daily grind of the process. And, I mean, no one better did it than, or said it and did it than Kobe Bryant. And so to be able to like learn from somebody like that on the daily grind, like don't worry about whether the shot's going in because percentage wise, I put in so much work, the next one has to go in, mm -hmm. right? right? And so I think it's like that repetition of greatness that I'm trying to instill in my daughter that it's not like the final result when it's time to take the last shot. It's like doing what was right and what was expected, you know, regardless of whether that shot goes in. It's getting up on the grind the next day. And so... I think that's what I would tell young athletes because everybody wants to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And when it's not happening in your time frame that you think it should, sometimes you quit or you let go or you, you know, you give in a little bit. I'm not sure where our time is right now, but I do want to open up to, to questions. Um, I believe we have people who are work either aisle here with microphones and while they get those in place. Okay. There's, we'll start on this side here. Who had a question? Uh, okay. Candace, thanks for being here. I grew up watching you, Lisa Leslie, and the other Candace. Uh, saw, like, undoubtedly, you guys played in the hardest time in the WNBA. What hurdles do you think the women of today are going to face that you didn't have to see, but I know that they're easier than what you dealt with? So, um, there's a woman by the name of Pat Summit. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be remiss if I did not mention her. And if social media had existed when I was in college, it would have been a problem. <laughs> like everything that these young ladies are doing now, everybody sees. And I was kind of at the beginning. Facebook started when I was in college. That's dating myself a little bit. Where you had to have an EDU to be on Facebook. Now my mom's telling me who's on vacation based off of social media or who did what or whatever. And so it's just the, the fishbowl. Um, where, and I talk to my daughter about this all the time, one text you send, one video that you're a part of, 
you're seeing come out in the NFL draft and the NBA draft and the WNBA draft. So it worries me a little bit because again, people make mistakes, especially when they're young, but to live in that fishbowl, um, it's a challenge. And so I think the, the, the women and the young ladies and the men across the board today are having to live in a time that, you know, we didn't and I didn't have to live in fully. It's easy to say I don't read it, but sometimes you do. When an athlete says they don't read the paper, they read the paper. <laughs> FYI, they read it. They hear it. Yeah. Because it, they have to hear it to not read it. Right? So it's like you read it and it does hurt the things. And I think you hold on to like the negatives more so than the positives of what people say. Um, because you hear it when you win. You hear it like, yeah, and you're wearing the shirts and you're doing all this stuff. And it's like you're, you're talking at the people that you heard, but you didn't hear them, you yeah. know? So it's one of those things as athletes, it's a balance of figuring out like who to listen to and, and you know, what to take personal. You, you mentioned Pat Summit. Um, how, much, how much did she create who you are as a person mentally as an athlete? There's one Pat Summit story that I tell um, that's worth a million trillion words. Um, Pat Summit was one of the hardest workers I've ever met in my life. And she was the same person in winning championships as she was in failures, losses, all of those things. She had the same mentality. And there was this one time where um, a young, stubborn Candace Parker was in practice one day. And of course, at 20 years old, you know everything, right? And she told me something, and I didn't do it two or three times down the court, so she kicked me out of practice. So I went in the back, and I'm fuming. I, you know, I'm showered. The team comes in, and, you know, Pat's like, you know, you're not on my court. You're not going to be on my court, da 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 So I decide the next day I'm going to show her. Like, I'm going to teach her a lesson, okay? So we had 6 a.m. practice because we had 8.30 class time. And so I, I get to the arena. I'm like, I'm going to get there at four o'clock. I'm going to be in a whole sweat. I'm going to have gotten up 300 shots. I'm going to be running up and down the court, be sweating. I'm going to show her that I'm willing to work and I want to be the best at this. Man, I pulled up to the arena. Her light was on. She was sitting at her desk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that to me is Pat, yeah. right? She's just, no matter if she's winning championships, she's showing up to Villanova and learning their offense. Like she's asking questions to the statistician about statistics on the road at Ole Miss. Like she was one of the greatest listeners I've ever met in my life. And I think everybody thinks leadership is talking and directing and pushing and pulling and trying to get the best out of people. But she would come to the timeout and she would say, what do you guys see? She would ask us questions. And I feel like when you're asking people that you're leading questions, they take ownership of what you're doing. And it's almost like equity, right? You're taking equity in the team because sometimes she would do what we wanted. And sometimes she said, no, we're doing this. And everybody would buy in because you felt heard. And so coach summit just had a way of bringing people together. She had that, that stare, um, but I have the tr a tremendous amount of respect for her, so much so that my second son's middle name is Summit. Yeah. That, that, that speaks volumes. Did she teach you, though, the mental part of the game? How did you embrace the mental part of, of, of being an elite athlete? The mental part is the hardest hurdle, I think, to, to overcome. You know, when you're at the free throw line and you miss two key free throws and 20,000 people are screaming your name and then you go to dinner the next day and people are like, why did you miss the free throw? And you're like, well, Jim, I wasn't trying to miss the free throw. Okay. Like, <laughs> I was trying to make the free throw. I promise you. you know, I wanted to make it more than you. Um, and so coach summit would always encourage us to continue to stay the process. Like I said, the relinquishing the results, the enjoying the journey. Um, if you all haven't heard of her definite dozen, I would love if you all would Google it. Um, and it's really special because I think she would assign, she would assign a definite dozen every time you came to camp campus. And I have an issue when I fail, I hang on to it. I think of it. I overthink. I, I try to make it better. 
I go in and I try to lift or I try to make that shot 500 times. And so every definite dozen she would assign to a player. And every year I came back, it would be handle success as you handle failure. Because sometimes I think we let go and we breeze past the success. Um, but we hang on to the failure and vice versa. Some athletes hang on to the success and let go of the failure a little too much. And so I think just the mental element is as good as watching her just every single day um, was a great example and watching the way that she handled success and handled failure. All right. Let me turn back to the audience here. We have a, a young lady here. Yes. Uh, here, we'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear you. Hello. My name is Tina. I'm also 38. So, and I went to Arkansas, so I got to watch you play when you were at Tennessee. Um, my question um, is about being a mother and balancing work and your career. When I think about Allison Felix and Serena Williams, you guys seemingly from the outside have done it flawlessly. Um, but I think it would be helpful to hear from you. I have a 15 month old and have a senior position at my company and it's been a, a challenge. So I'm interested in hearing how you've balanced your career and your, your role as a mom. Well, first, congratulations. Um, I had my daughter, gosh, I was pregnant with her at the Olympics. I didn't have any idea in 2008. So she always tells people that she won a gold medal <laughs> before she was born. And that season after my rookie season, I found out I was expecting a baby girl. And when I tell you I've always wanted to be a mom, like always, you could catch me at college on a Friday night. I was babysitting. I always have my nieces and nephews around. Um, I think my wife is going to strangle me because I really am trying to have another one. We have three and I'm still like, can we just one more, please? Like I love kids. Um, and I always wanted a big family. And so when I had my daughter, it was just like, she's going to come along for the journey. And I want her to be witness to the ups and downs and the struggles. And I think sometimes as mothers, we try to hide and I'm not going to say as mothers, I think as parents, we try to hide the struggles that come along and the good days and the bad days. And I've just been really raw with her from the time she was younger, you know, at, at the challenges and at the struggles. And I found that parents have a lot of guilt that you're not doing enough, that they're, you know, in some way, shape or form, not getting what they need. But to be honest with you, I found out later, like you just have to do the best you can. And some days are better than others. Um, some days I have more to give than other days. The biggest thing that I try to develop with my kids is they know that they're super important. And so I'm, I'm like you probably, I'm on, on the road quite a bit. So when my daughter was three, she didn't understand like mommy was leaving for this amount of days. So we would do sleep calendars. So she would make me a sleep calendar of how many days I was away. I would make her and on FaceTime, we would cross out the sleep calendars at night. I think there's other ways Yes, being present is super important, but even when you're not present, like making them feel, you know, important. And um, we would do homework on FaceTime. Um, and I will be honest, I don't know, do you have a boy or a girl? Okay, I thought I had parenting figured out with my 15 year old. I was like, yeah, this girl, I, I've got it, girls. And then my son came along. So good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. But um, balancing, you know, being a parent and career is really difficult. And I think it's a challenge in different ways for different people. So I think it's just giving yourself grace, giving others grace. I think sometimes the best thing is to tell a mom, or tell a dad, I see you, I feel you <laughs> like it's a challenge. Um, and to have encouragement, but like you said, I've had, you know, Tina Thompson had a son, uh, Lisa Leslie had a daughter before, before I was. So I was able to have examples of parents that juggled playing as well as, um, being a parent. These are great questions. Who has another? You have a question? Yes, sir. Um, hi, I'm Gary. Thank you, Candace. This is amazing. Lester, amazing. Thank I want to drill down a little more on where we are, the, the WNBA projectory, not a moment, a projectory upward and ownership. Do you believe we're in a magic Larry Bird space where it's going to help the WNBA take off because of Angel and, and Caitlin? And you want to be an owner of an NBA team, I would think now, <laughs> now, right, right now, mm -hmm. yesterday mm -hmm. would be the perfect time because of the potential or 
probable, unbelievable trajectory of uh, WEA popularity, value. You said, look at the numbers. Numbers don't lie. I think we are in an important era of basketball in general. Um, I think these young athletes, you're having an opportunity to know them, be a part of their story, be a part of their growth. Um, but again, the explosion, how do we make this not a moment and have it be momentum to the next? And to be honest with you, we talk about Magic and Larry, but really it was Michael, right? Like Michael took that from being a moment to momentum. So I think it's how do we get to that? Who are we eyeing as a league? How do we continue to allow people to not just have name recognition with rivalries, um, but have it across the board? Um, and the talent. I mean, we, we still have to continue to get better at basketball. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be elite level basketball for eyes to stick. Exactly. And you, you know that, Juju Watkins. We have the next. But having the next isn't just, I mean, you got to be in the league and you got to dominate. You know, the next have to dominate. And so I think across the board, the talent, I mean, you look at the NBA, and I'm not talking about the 90s, but in the 90s, you didn't have to shoot to keep a job. In the NBA, you got to shoot to keep a job. Or you got to be like 7'2 or 7'3 and be able to block all the shots. But you have to be able to shoot the ball a little bit. So I think now the, the bar is being raised on women's basketball. And in terms of ownership, I want it to be right. So I'm, I'm working with Mark Lazary, who owned the Bucks, uh, sold the Bucks last year, has started a sports fund. So I'm an advisor on that fund. And the goal is obviously to invest in sports across the board. He made a promise to me on the day that I signed on that 20% of the fund would be towards women's sports. And so I think it's making smart decisions and not jumping just because, like you said, the, the valuations are high. It's figuring out what the right situation is and how we can truly make an impact. Because, listen, this isn't a charity. I've said this from the get-go. It's not a charity. It's an investment. And so we want to figure out, like, how we can best invest and and again, grow the game, but also get the best return on our money. As brand ambassador to Adidas, what can you do to show that happening? It's, it's, listen, volleyball is the fastest growing young sport. In order to sustain the talent pool in the WNBA, we need more young girls playing basketball. And for so long, I think parents were hesitant to put their daughters in basketball for many different reasons. And now I think we're going to see because of the growth at the WNBA level, you're going to have more involvement at the grassroots level. And hopefully we have a lot of those feet have Adidas on them. Let's, go, let's see if we have another question over on this side. Uh, this gentleman in the black hat. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Anthony Devon. I'm with the Kip Foundation. Candice, you a champ. You know, I appreciate you coming out. Um, my question is, and you kind of alluded to this towards the end, um, you're seeing a lot of players have so much power and obviously them on a court, but outside. And so now these players are more looked at as like a business, as a company, like Dwayne Wade, like you said, Magic Johnson, now yourself. So like what advice would you give to these current superstar WNBA players, Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, who are, like you said, it's more than basketball. These are now like companies who are balling on and off the court and now Juju Watkins, like what advice would you give to these new young um, superstars? That is a really good question. I think taking ownership of your brand is number one. Um, I think that's super important. There's a lot of times as athletes that you don't ask the questions that you should. Um, you give it off to somebody because of time and I understand. But the earlier that you understand the business element of stuff and the more you ask questions, I've learned the more, the more people want to help and the more relationships that you establish and are able to get. It's all about relationships. Let's be honest. I think it's access and it's relationships. 
And when the ball's going through the hoop and the lights are on, you have access and you have relationships with a lot of people. As soon as that ball stops going through the hoop and the lights kind of dim a little bit, your access gets a little bit less. And as players, if you're able to grow that while you're playing, while you're in the game and learn as much as you can, I think you're going to be able to have that after the ball stops bouncing. And there's something else too. And this goes back to, sorry, I want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this, in the WNBA. I think the WNBA, the other adjustment that they need to make is the coaches are making more than the players. I'm going to say that again. In what league, and this is no knock on the coaches, I think Becky deserves the contract that she gets. I think that Mark Davis did an amazing job of being first in that. But in no league did I go to see Phil Jackson call the triangle offense. He's great. He won championships and things like that. But I went to go see Michael Jordan hoop. And so I think that once that gets figured out in the WNBA, there's a lot of things like that that I think players in this generation are going to take advantage of and, and, and make, a, make a point to, to change. Kenz, I want to ask you, I'm listening to you here, and I mean, you've really found your voice, obviously. Is there, is there a certain freedom now? Are you speaking from a place that you wouldn't have been able to speak to prior to April? I think it's so funny because th I have always spoke like this and I think I've lost some people's ears and I've gained some people, you know, in retrospect over time. And um, I don't know if early in my career the world was ready for the things that I had to say, but I still try to keep saying them, you know, and hope that, you know, you kind of grow and learn from each generation. Like, I hope that the WNBA is going to be a little bit more of themselves because of our generation of players that were unapologetic in the way that we dressed and what we said and how we conducted business, what we talked to the media about, who we love um, on down. And would, you, would you encourage young, young women athletes to push, to, to make their voices known, to, to become advocates for themselves? You can see through authenticity. And if something's not authentic, I think consumers public fans, everybody can see it. And so it's, sta it's standing on that and it's standing on, you know, asking the questions and, and being the driving force and what's right and what's wrong and what you believe and who you are. So I think it's super important. And I listen, I listen to my daughter every day. I don't think this generation has any problem with saying what they feel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've watched this where I'm just like, Oh my goodness. But you, you have to love it. Any favorite memories of your 16 seasons? Oh my goodness. I know that's a broad that question. That is a broad question. I think 2016 was a special one just because you, I went through all the, the hurdles and the downs. Uh, Coach Summit passed away in 2016. I didn't make the Olympic team. I was coming off an injury. Um, and we all put it together and were able to win the championship basically on like a last second shot. And, um, you know, it was really special to be able to to finally win that championship um, and to be a part of that team. That that team was a special group. And I, we're almost out of time, but but who did you inspire? What what players relied on your advice? I think the most important player is my daughter. Um, she looks at me every single day, and it was crazy because we have a workout room, and you could see it from the kitchen, and I. I can remember her just walking by and like looking sometimes at me working out and I see that she's really watching and I, she may not immediately be getting everything and it has nothing to do with sports. Mm -hmm. I hope she looks through my office and sees me working towards that now. I hope she understands how important hard work is and again, I want to follow Pat Summit's lead and I don't want to just tell her. I want to like show her on a daily basis and so I think all our kids are watching not what we say, but how we do it and how we conduct ourselves. And so I think she's the most important player through my whole career that I've tried to inspire. Well, Candace, it has been a real honor and a pleasure. I was, Thank you. I was excited about this opportunity. Uh, let me thank the audience for the great questions. And thank you for all you've done. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.